Ronald, thank you very much, and thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Goedemiddag, als het klonk van ons mensen wat iets zo ons kan. Hallo, zei een Afrikaans, but it's very nice to be here, and I want to start off by saying what I said last year, or was it the year before. Um, I'm not a fund manager. I'm an advisor, but I only work for my client, and my client pays me nobody else, and it's very important to realize what I'm saying and how it differs from a fund manager. Fund managers have to do what they do. They've got to construct their funds in terms of their mandate, and they must keep to it, but they mustn't jump around. And in South Africa alone, we have 1,800 funds to choose from, and globally, we've got about 30,000 funds to choose from, so it's almost impossible to know who are the good funds and the bad funds, but that's what we do at a company like Breakfast. But before I carry on with my talk and before I forget, a small, and I know Alex not here, Alec and I go back many, many decades. In fact, him and I worked together in the same building. He was upstairs, I was downstairs, and we used to go to press conferences. And even in those early days, you could see Alec was something special. At the age of 22 or 23, he won the Sun of Financial Advi uh, 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 Journalist of the, of the Year Award, which was quite an achievement. And since then, he's been the great survivor. He's been to APSA, he's been horse racing, he's been MoneyWeb, he founded, listed on the stock exchange. He was booted out of MoneyWeb by corporate shenanigans, started business. And I just want to say, well done, Alec. You've been a great friend. You've been very loyal. And I think what he's done, Alec, with business and the conferences and what he's creating, an independent platform for people like you to come and listen, get the facts, and make up your own mind. And, you know, so I, I hope that message gets to Alec. And Alec has been incredibly loyal to me. We played lots of golf. We, uh, he doesn't drink anymore, does he? Neither do I. But, I, but anyway, here we are. He's been a great friend and he's done great stuff. Let me start off by asking anybody in the audience, do, who knows what a Rorschach test is? The psychologists will know. You know that Rorschach test when they want to test your personality, they put this ink blot in front of you. And they ask, can you do me later? <laughs> <laughs> and they ask you, what do you see? The economy is like that. And some people see a butterfly. Some people see a bat. That depends what you see. And nobody is right. Nobody is wrong. The same with the economy, the same with financial markets. The markets are simply just too big for anybody to be 100% correct at any given time. Now, let's just go back in time. Like Alec, I was very fortunate to be a financial journalist for many years, traveled the world, been to many conferences. Not like Alec has been to Davos 19 times or something. But I've, I've, I've always approached South Africa from a different perspective. Uh, Bearing in mind, in the old days, exchange control, and you could not take your money offshore. 1997, and we started opening up the doors. So for most of our early lives, we were focused only on one stock exchange because we couldn't take the money out. Now that changed, 97. Then we had the dot-com bubble, so not a great time to go offshore. And then from 2002 to 2008, we had one of the biggest commodity booms ever. And the JSC benefited tremendously from this boom in commodities brought on by China. And there was no question, SA, the JSC was the place to be. People made money, value funds were running at 30 to 40%. And so from 2002 to 2008, the JSC was one of the, if not the best, performing stock market in the world. So. If you try to convince people to go offshore, you probably would not have succeeded. Financial crisis, and also, as our luck, I forgot to mention, the World Cup was coming our way. So we had this massive construction boom, railways, bridges, highways, stadiums. It was a perfect time. The books balanced. There was no reason to go offshore with your money. Financial crisis, since then, end of the commodity cycle, and around about 2011, 2012, I came across a gentleman by the name of John Ward, and I went to one of his conferences, 
And he started telling me about what's happening in the United States. He, he spoke about biotechnology. He spoke about technology. And he spoke about great global themes happening in the world. Apologies. <coughs> and I started getting very interested in this. Why, what, how, where can South Africans invest in these? And to my amazement, I found you can't. We're a commodity-producing country, lots of retailers, lots of banks, and they've done well. But there was something going on in the United States, which we were not part of as an investor. So at Brentus, I then started going around asking for overseas fund managers, can we get access to your funds, Templetons and the Fidelities and the Vanguards? Because that's what the market was doing. The market in the U.S. had been running for a couple of years, and it kept on running. Year after year, it just accelerated, and it was very obvious to see what was happening. That's where, the, was, where you had to put your money. So that didn't make me very popular with a fund man. If I said on radio or in print, I think you must take some of your money offshore. And here are the reasons. Nothing to do with politics. We get into politics. I said, it was said, and it was very apparent, the global market was booming. The S&P 500, as we now know, looking back in time, was a phenomenal place to be with your money. So the African fund managers have not, or did not have the capability of managing money in the global market. Since then, that has changed. This morning on my email, I got a 91, has got a conference on offshore. Uh, Coronation got a conference on offshore. They're selling new products. Septrix yesterday announced a new fund that takes money offshore. So my comment on this was, you guys are 10 years too late. This should have been happening. But remember, fund management business is a business. You run and you sell what you have in stock. So there's been no question, and I just want to give you some of the statistics on the performance of the U.S. market, for instance, over the last 10 years. The USP, or the US, S&P 500, over 16 years, had a cumulative return of 427%. That is astounding wealth that was created if you have been in that market. International market, excluding the USA, 85% dollar terms. Emerging markets, 35%. South African market, 22%. As Coronation admitted two weeks ago to AGM, there's been a lost decade. People investing in JSC in dollar terms have made no money for 10 to 15 years. Now, that's a, that sounds like just a, a fact, but it's, it's a dreadful fact for people that and I and I believe that people should consider their dollar inflation rate more than their South African inflation rate. And I'll come to that in a second. They rest out on one of the biggest booms uh, the stock markets have known for a very very long time because of our focus on the South African market. The media focuses on the JSC, the RAND, the gold price. The big global themes have moved on. So as an advisor, we had to advise our clients to get money offshore. And up to 2015, we could only take small amounts, 200, 400,000 per person. Or we could do it via asset swaps. That means you exchange with these big companies, you use their asset swap capacity, and you can and get dollars until the day that you take it out again. And those returns have been phenomenal. They have been phenomenal for our clients. But... 1st of April 2015, can you remember what happened then? Well, you can't because it was a long time ago. And it was my birthday, by the way. Happy birthday. But anyway, government announced, Treasury announced the 10 million offshore allowance and the 1 million per year. And I don't think, and I still believe today, that the industry doesn't or didn't realize what a dramatic change it was for South Africans to be able to externalize most or a great deal of the assets. And they kept on saying it's not necessary, offshore markets are expensive. And with all due respect to, to Pitt and, and, and other 
advisors who kept on saying, oh, no, 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 aftermarket's are expensive and it's dangerous and the PE is. They've always been high, yet they've produced these kind of returns. You cannot ignore that. I think the, the, the asset management industry also didn't anticipate this great desire to get money out of the country for political reasons. We had the Zuma years, we had the group. At BEE, we had cater deployment, we have the collapse. All of that, and this is where a financial advisor sits in a different position. I sit across the table from a gentleman, Mr. Jones or whatever. Mr. Jones is talking about his fears, aspirations, and his objectives. And now he or she can externalize a great deal of their assets legally, after tax, perfectly uh, normal. And they did, and they still are taking their money offshore. So far, in the last nine and a half years, since the introduction of that 10 million, we've seen the disparity in returns. Those people who took their money offshore, bring those returns back in, in rand terms today, they have done double or treble and treble what the local market had to offer. And yes, it's affecting the JSC, but the JSC is being affected by other factors of single investors. Single investors are looking after their own affairs, and we have to guide them accordingly. And it all depends on the asset base. So, yes, I've been called Dr. Doom and Dr. This and, and, and Professor That. My advice has been based on what is happening real time in the world. Secondly, what is happening in South Africa. Thirdly, it's been in reaction from what the, the public demanded to protect or to externalize some of their assets for their future use and their future benefits. And lastly, and very importantly, we've also noticed in our business, and I'm allowed 20 seconds of promotional, we're not countrywide, we've got nine offices, we've got 25 advisors, etc. We have thousands of clients. Almost, we pick up what people are thinking almost better than any other research material because people talk to us like a psychologist. They talk about their fears. They worry about their children. They talk about their grandchildren. And... What I was been developing over the last couple of years, we've realized that our clients are more dollarized than people expect. You, we all look at the CPI inflation in South Africa and we compare returns with the CPI of 5 or 6% and we say, oh, we've got 8%, we beat inflation. And I've been doing some work and this is where I miss my old friend Mike Sushler so badly. Mike was my go-to guy whenever I had issues to, to investigate. And I would ask Mike, go and, go and check this out, Mike. And he would come back with the answers, which mainly differed, or differed mainly from the mainstream economists and the sunshine economists. Mike was straight down the line. He didn't care what, what people said or thought. His facts were very, very accurate. So, but I have a suspicion, and I, and I, and I tested by talking to people. I say, what are your main expenses? And I, I, would, I would bet for 90% of the audience today, they fall in that category. We spend the greatest portion of the wealth or income on things like, which is linked to the dollar, motor cars, petrol, cell phones, computers, overseas travel, overseas study, and all those items that are priced in dollars. And if you strip out that and have it as a separate component, your dollar inflation rate converted to rands is, in my estimation, about 12 to 13%. So if you're saving in rands, getting returns in rands in the local market at 6 or 7%, you are getting poorer by the day, by the year. And this is what has happened the last 15 years. And why do I say that? The other asset class for most people is property, residential property. Even if you include uh, Western Cape. Since 2007, I actually did the numbers last night. The average re return on residential property in South Africa compared to inflation is minus 30%. So you've actually lost money against inflation in South Africa. And if you do that in dollars, it's minus 60%. So where can or should an advisor create an offshore portfolio for people? It can only be with discretionary investments. It can only be with the money that you can take out $1 million per year and or more at $10 million. And that has been a very, very good strategy for our clients. So when... Fund managers complain and they talk too much about offshore. I'm saying it's true, but the results are in. 
it's like a, an election. You can say what you like, but when you compare like for like, offshore has been for the last 15 years an outstanding place to place your bets and protect your capital. And I also come back to families with immigration, possible future immigration. Where will your kids be in 10 or 15 years? Will they be in South Africa? Will they be offshore? If you are building or, or constructing a portfolio priced in rands, especially with the way the rand is going and the mismanagement of the economy, you run a very great risk of not being able to afford it. We see it already in, in places like Mauritius. I mean, 10 years ago, with a rand at 8 to, 8, to, 8 to the dollar or 10 to the dollar, you could buy a very de- uh, a nice place in Mauritius for, let's say, four or $500,000. Okay, so that's five, six million rand. Due to the depreciation of the currency and the price rise in Mauritius, most South Africans, expe- excepting the very, very rich, cannot afford even to buy a house in Mauritius anymore. You know, pay 20 million rand for a three bedroom apartment. That's why people are moving to places like Hermanus and, and, and they've become captives in the currency boat. And that's the biggest danger of advising people. Where do you want to be? What do you, how do you see your life? And again, as financial advisors, we look at the global trends. We look at the economy. Undeniably, economy has been mismanaged. Undeniably, there's been theft of, 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 of really trillions of dollars. I remember a conversation I had with the late um, Dr. Simon Murray from Alan Gray Orbis many years ago. And I asked him, we were talking about Alan Gray was going offshore at the time and they were all about a chat about Orbis. And I asked him, my first question was, I said, Doctor, what is the first thing that you look at when you look at investing in a country? And without question, he said law and order. First and foremost, law and order. And from there, they will look at corporate profitability, blah, blah, blah. And to me, that stuck. And I, uh, this discussion was 15 to 20 years ago. And based purely on just law and order as, as, as a guiding light, you know, you have to consider that South Africa is not a great place to put your money. And there's not enough time for me to go through the whys and the whys out and what's happening. But you are in a situation the markets are telling you something. One of the statistics that I look at almost every Friday, what are the foreigners doing in our market? We had Ramaporia in 2018. There was a bit of an uplift in the market. And I've got a slide. Yeah, unfortunately, we can't review slides today. But the headline of the slide, it was the headline of the business day. This is 2018, after the JSC had underperformed world markets for 10 years. On the 18th of March, 2018, there's a headline in the business day that says, Old Mutual expects SA equities to outperform the global average. That was on TV. It was Roman probably interviewed them on TV, and Old Mutual was bullish and it basically says South Africa will be the best place to put your money going forward over the next five years. And that was on TV. And, and, and all the advisors went around saying this. We disagreed very strongly. We said, we just don't buy this. It's not possible. I did an evaluation last, last night. I looked at the performance of the old mutual investors fund, which is the prime fund, the flagship fund. It returned 4% per annum over five years, as opposed to world markets, that average 28% for the NASDAQ, 21% for the S&P, 18% for the, for, the, for, the, for the MSI world. So this is the stuff that advisors have to deal with. You've got the media speak of the big companies who are trying to protect their businesses and try to convince people that everything is okay and Allah sallallahu But I don't see it in the facts. I look at these things daily. I look at the outflows. Since Ramak, Also came into power, more than a trillion rand has left the JSE, either the equity or the bond market. A trillion rand. So far this year, the number is 28 billion. So we're heading for another 100 billion rand outflow. Trade on the JSE is down. It's becoming problematic. There are very, very few new listings. I'm very glad to hear that we buy cars is listing quite soon. So that's the kind of stuff that we need as, as, as as a stock market. It, but it's all the money just moving around in the same circles. Pete was talking about market concentration of the Magnificent Seven being 35% of the S&P 500. Well, the top 10 shares on the JSC, of which eight are geolisted stocks, 
The top 10 shares represent 62% of market cap. Of the, so if you're worried about market capitalization as a risk factor, the JFC is not the place where you want to be. So ladies and gentlemen, let me end on that note and by saying we're forever being confronted by issues and threats in South Africa. And I always say to people, there's one thing you can never say in South Africa that you can never say it will never happen here. And I'm referring to things like expropriation without compensation. It's happening. I'm talking about national health insurance. For how long have people said, oh, it'll never happen? It's happening. Prescribed assets, back on the table. They said very clearly last week said, we're coming for the pension funds. It's a risk that you have to consider. Plus other issues. I mean, I'm not even talking about, you know, the, the difficulty that our companies have of making a profit. And a bit also compared like a, a chicken manufacturer or, or in South Africa versus one in Australia or America. I mean, the guys, they've got the, I've got the dice loaded so much against them in South Africa with collapsing of road, collapse of railways, the ports, government that's mistrustful of the private sector. And there's this, this, so I have to look at all those things and I can only get to give you the advice that I think is appropriate for each and every client. And it's not true that we've externalized everything for all of our clients. There are simply some clients who cannot live with the volatility. Very happily put them in local enhanced income funds, money market funds, bond funds without the risks. But until the facts change, my advice and the advice that you will get from a company, and many companies nowadays to do that, will be to externalize your discretionary capital, build a nest egg overseas. You're not being disloyal to the country. It's legal. You're protecting your, your family's wealth because we don't know. And I, I'm listening to all these forecasts on the, on the election. We don't know what's going to happen. We can make forecasts and can, we can hope for the best. We can hope for the worst. But... There is so much uncertainty. And until I start seeing the signs, and one of them will be seeing the foreigners starting to buy our shares. And we speak often to our fund managers in London who run our global funds. And, and Glenn Owen is a very experienced fund manager, and I often write to him and say, Glenn, are the foreigners buying SA shares? And he just writes back and says, we're not on the radar. They're not even looking at South Africa. So but right now, there is a global trend. It's been the U.S. for 15 years. Japan is busy recovering and has made phenomenal returns for investors. So I spoke earlier about India. India is another place to consider. There's another trend that you've never heard of, but you're hearing it for the first time. The granolas. Never heard of the granolas. Very few people know that there are 11 European companies listed on various stock exchanges in Europe that has outperformed the Magnificent Seven. It just hasn't become a media event yet. So you've heard it here the first time, Granolas, and that stands for the seven or the 11 companies listed in Europe that have outperformed the Magnificent Seven, but the media attention is not on them. So there are other areas of the world that offer great value. Argentina could be another one, depending on what's happened there. So... And as my wife said last night when she was doing my charts, I said, is there nothing, no good news in your talks? <laughs> I said, yes, my darling. The Rugby World Cup is in three years. We should wear that again. But I can only give the facts as they present themselves. I repeat what I'm saying. I only get paid by one person as my client. If I don't give advice, which I think is honest and researched and, and, and carefully calibrated with all the other things out there, I shouldn't have a business because then I'm just a normal salesman. Thank you for that.